How's it going, everyone, and welcome to Probing Paul. This is my monthly Q&A video, monthly, every every two weeks, whenever I feel like it. It's pretty much when I'm doing it these days. The way this works is that you guys uh, ask me questions in former Probing Paul videos in the comment section. Here's a look at past videos. Uh, again, we're up to number 54 now, and I also sent a tweet out on Twitter, so I'm also gonna be responding to a few Twitter questions, too. And I don't know if you guys are excited, but uh, I'm pretty excited. Excellent! Team Group's Dark Z series of DDR4 gaming memory features an aggressive yet stylish armored design with high performance aluminum alloy heat sinks to keep thermals in check. The Dark Z series uses specially selected high quality modules to achieve DDR4 speeds up to 3600 with XMP 2.0 support for easy setup, and kits are available in capacities of up to 32 gigabytes per DIMM, perfect for a gaming PC or a high end workstation. Click the sponsor link in the description for more. Okay, first question here is from Dylan Castile, and he says, do you think Big Navi will have the same launch issues as the RTX 3080? And that's a very good question, a very big question, and actually uh, had some also questions about the RTX 3070, which is also expected to launch at the end of October. And my answer would be yes. Uh, yes, I think there's going to be really high demand for these cards. I think they're going to sell out immediately, and I think you're going to have the same situation with people trying to buy them and resell them with scalping situations. Hopefully we're not going to have uh, manufacturers trying to scalp the cards again, because that would kind of suck. And yes, that's a reference to MSI, who apparently had a subsidiary that was selling their cards for well above MSRP with the RTX uh, 3080. And I think there's a couple different reasons for this. One is just that new cards, new hardware, when it first launches, especially if you're dealing with something that has had had a long time between prior launches, like it was about two years since the launch of the 20 series to the 30 series, you're going to have those bleeding edge gamers who always want to have the new and best thing who are interested in upgrading, and you're going to have a lot of other people who are in a situation this year because it's 2020 and there's a lot of people who have been stuck at home and because of that they've spent a lot more time playing games and maybe people have got into PC gaming who weren't into it before. And then I think you also have a bunch of people who still have income coming in who haven't lost their jobs or anything due to the pandemic, but who also haven't been spending their money because they they haven't been able to go out and do the recreational activities that they might normally do, so they might be like, oh, we actually have a little bit of extra money to spend, and hey, a $700 graphics card now seems to be within our price range, whereas a few years ago maybe it wasn't, or maybe a few years ago they just would have rather gone on vacation or something like that and spent the money there. Unfortunately, I don't think there's a good solution to your question if you're really looking forward to maybe buying a big Navi card. Again, we're still waiting on the announcement, the big announcement, which will be at the end of October, and then I'm guessing they're going to launch sometime in November. Of course, the performance is going to be a factor and how it actually stacks up against the former RTX 2080 Ti or against the new RTX 3070, 3080, and 3090s. But as long as people are able to continue to buy the cards, relist them on eBay or some other uh, selling service and get twice as much as what they paid for them, people are going to continue to do that because that's kind of how capitalism works and all you can really do is make a commitment and, and you know get all your friends to make a commitment to not buy these overpriced cards because it's just going to take time. Each wafer that comes off of the manufacturer line only has so many viable GPUs that are able to be used. Those are put into working cards and those are distributed to be sold. As long as those keep getting snapped up, there's going to be a shortage, so it's kind of a difficult situation to deal with as a consumer because you just want to buy the card at the price they're being advertised for. But like I said, you just got to brace yourself. You got to be patient. You got to try your best to buy something, but uh, don't pay too much. And you might just need to wait a few months or until sometime in 2021 before the prices actually normalize and you can actually find cards in stock. I wish I had a better answer for that first question, but let's move on. Uh, Jack Lenine asks, Hey Paul, what high resolution gaming monitor would you recommend for the 3000 series cards? I'm a competitive gamer, but I want a higher resolution to take advantage of the card's power. So you said 3000 series, but I'm going to answer this based on people who might have an RTX 3080 or might be anticipating getting an RTX 3080 if they can find one for sale. This might somewhat apply to the RTX 3070 as well, but uh, let's look at what monitors are actually available. And I'm using PC Part Picker here just because they have nice layout to look at monitors that are in stock. Bear in mind that PC Part Picker is not an exhaustive list of all PC hardware or PC related hardware out there, so you should always reality check, but it's a good way to get an idea of the pricing. If you want bang for the buck though, I'd recommend a 2560 by 1440 monitor uh, still, uh, especially if you want to get uh, sort of a combination of features, because you want a higher resolution, higher than 1080 ideally, and 1440 is a nice midpoint between 1080 and 4K. You probably want to take advantage of variable refresh rate, because that's one of the features that's kind of becoming standardized in gaming, especially once the new consoles launch, and you want a high refresh rate to go along with that variable refresh rate, I would say 120 hertz minimum, but probably 144 hertz or higher. Beyond that, there are other things to 
also consider like uh, the panel quality if you want IPS or something like that for better color depth. If you're gonna be doing any content creation or color grading or anything like that, then you should definitely pay attention to that. But if your focus is strictly gaming, then I think you can focus on the resolution, the refresh rate, variable refresh rate, and then of course the size of the monitor and the price. So you can get a 2560 by 1440 monitor and I'm only looking at 144 Hertz and up here. And these are starting at uh, about 250 to $300 for the more budget options. But you'll notice you have quite a few options. So that means there's some competition in this range and that means you might be able to get a better price or better features. Also keep in mind the screen size over here, 27 inches I think is sort of the baseline you should go for, but uh, getting something a little bit bigger is also nice. That said, I think I would focus on the uh, resolution and the refresh rate before I go for a larger size monitor. Also consider stuff like HDR support if that's something you're interested in. And then if you're specifically buying something for an RTX 3080 or an, an Nvidia graphics card, you can go with a G-Sync monitor or a FreeSync monitor. G-Sync might give you a little bit better results overall, but there's plenty of FreeSync monitors that work just fine with variable refresh rate with Nvidia cards. If you're considering one of the new big Navi cards, which we still don't know a whole lot about, uh, but you will want to get a FreeSync capable monitor because at this point, AMD cards uh, do not work with G-Sync monitors. If you want higher resolution than 1440, you can go up to 4K, but if you want 4K along with that high refresh rate, like 144 Hertz or better, you really don't have many options. There is a Viotech and an LG and an Asus down here for 750 to $800. That's quite a bit of a premium to pay over the 1440 models for that high resolution. And bear in mind, these are all 27 inch panels, so you can't really get anything that's much bigger than that. If you really want 4K right now, I would point you towards some of the new TVs that have come out because you can get like a 48 inch 4K TV that has HDMI 2.1 for variable refresh rate up to 120 Hertz. And that's a really nice crossover between like a TV that you can also use for gaming. And since you are talking about PC gaming, you have the option for ultra wide as well, which is 21 by nine aspect ratio as opposed to 16 by nine. For that, I'd recommend 3440 by 1440. And here again, you actually have a few more options than you do with 4K monitors. And you can get some for in the five to six to $700 range. This isn't quite as many pixels as 4K. So in an equivalent game, you should be able to get a slightly higher frame rate with an ultra wide versus straight up 4K. But again, just double check the game that you're intending to play to make sure they support ultra wide if you're gonna go that route. And just bear in mind, sometimes you do have to shrink a 3440 by 1440 ultra wide game down to 2560 by 1440. And that just is gonna depend on the game that you're playing. But hopefully that gives you some advice for what I would recommend if you're looking for a new monitor to pair right now with one of the new RTX 3080s, RTX 3070s, or, or even some suggestions there for the new big Navi cards. Next question here from Ray Luna. Hey Paul, long time fan, watched your PC build guides before. I even had a PC. That's good. You, sh you should watch the build guides first and then, then build, but uh, <laughs> here's your question, Ray. What's a fairly priced M.2 drive that is two terabytes? Trying to go full M.2 on my next build, thanks in advance. I had this question asked a few other places. I actually uh, had, had some Twitter uh, people asking about M.2 NVMe drives as well. So I'm gonna go through what I would do if I was looking for a good price on an M.2 NVMe drive, especially if I was looking for one that was a higher capacity. I very often now I'm recommending uh, a one terabyte M.2 NVMe drive if you're willing to spend about 100 to $120 on your main storage drive. But for me, the M.2 NVMe SSDs kind of fall into three categories. There's your entry level M.2 NVMe, and this is where you can usually get the bang best bang for the buck. And if you look at the raw read and write stats on those drives, it'll usually range from about 1500 megabytes per second up to 2000, maybe in the low 2000s range for uh, reads and writes. Usually writes are gonna be a little bit slower than the reads. And often those drives will be PCI Express Gen 3, which is totally fine. Then there's the nice PCI Express 3.0 M.2 NVMe drives. Those will usually range from about maybe 2,500 megabytes per second reads and writes all the way up to 3,000, sometimes even 3,500 to 4,000 megabytes per second reads and writes. And at that point, towards the higher end, you're actually bumping into the bandwidth limitation of PCIe 3.0. Finally, you have the newest and fastest M.2 NVMe drives, which are PCI Express 4.0 uh, drives like the Corsair Force MP600. This has up to 4,250 megabytes per second sequential writes and up to 4,950 megabytes per second sequential reads. So between four and 5,000 gigabytes per second uh, reads and writes, which is really fast and honestly not really necessary for a gaming PC. Most of the advantages that you get with an M.2 NVMe drive, you're gonna get even with those more entry level drives, which, which you can get for a price per gigabyte that's a lot closer to current SATA drives. But again, let's use PC Part Picker really quick to take a look at what's available on the market. So if you're looking at storage, uh, you want to drill down to SSDs. Right now for capacity, I'm looking at two terabyte drives, but including some three terabyte drives in there too, if they exist. So if you just 
factor those in and you sort by price per gigabyte, you're gonna get a mix of serial ATA and M.2 drives. And bear in mind that M.2 drives can still be serial ATA, which is a little bit confusing. So you might look at this Western Digital Blue drive and be like, ooh, two terabytes and ooh, $176. That's uh, less than 10 cents per gigabyte, which is a good price per gigabyte for an SSD. But double check the drive itself. This is a SATA 3 drive. It uses the M.2 interface to actually plug in with that M.2 plug, but it still uses the SATA protocol to communicate with the motherboard. So these drives are made for upgrades in like notebooks or some motherboards that can, that can operate both in PCI Express mode or in SATA mode. But these drives will still max out at the maximum throughput of SATA, which is going to be around 550 megabytes per second. So first off, if you're looking for high capacity, two terabytes, uh, consider some of the SATA drives because you can get a very nice SATA SSD uh, for this price. But if you really want M.2 NVMe, uh, you probably want M.2 2280 because that's the form factor that fits in most boards. And then bear in mind, you're going to be paying about 10 cents per gigabyte for these drives. That's about $200 uh, for a two terabyte drive. I believe the A-Data Swordfish is an actual NVMe drive. Yes, it says NVMe right here. But like I said, this is entry-level NVMe, so 1200 to 1800 megabytes per second reads and writes, which is right in that entry-level range that I was talking about. But that's still two to three times as fast as a SATA drive. So you are getting an advantage here by going NVMe. And there's also some, some kind of lower level advantages to go in, going NVMe, which I'm not going to get into right now. And like I said, PC Part Picker isn't going to have all the drives listed. So you can look at this to sort stuff and sort of drill down and get an idea of prices. And then you can sort of reality check at your favorite retailer and see if they have any sales that are going on or anything like that that might get you a better deal. PC Part Picker does have an NVMe checkbox, so we can check that to get rid of uh, SATA drives that might be on this list. And I do hope they integrate something that will let you separate the PCI Express uh, 3.0 drives from the 4.0 drives, but you just kind of have to take it a, a drive at a time right now for that. But like I said, if you're looking for a high capacity NVMe SSD, bang for the buck, those kind of entry level ones are what I would point you towards. Watch out for SATA drives. And finally, keep in mind that some drives like this Intel 660p drive do use QLC NAND flash, which means there's four bits stored per cell within the flash memory. So if you're hitting it with a lot of reads and writes, the cache will fill up and then the drive will slow down after that point. So that's one last thing to bear in mind if you're looking for that bargain on an NVMe drive. Thank you for the question though. Here's another one from Twitter from That Ghost Trainer. Uh, hey Paul, due to narrowly avoided disaster with an AIO, would you recommend keeping the stock Prism Wraith cooler on a 2700X or go aftermarket? Plans for the 3080 once the market relax relaxes, just unsure of the cooler, but it can't be too much taller than the stock cooler. So a few different aspects to this question. One is that if you want to stick with air and height is a concern for you, uh, it sounds like with a 2700X, you probably are okay sticking with that stock Wraith Prism cooler. That's a perfectly adequate cooler. If you do want a little bit more performance or if it's making a little bit too much noise for you, I would point you towards uh, Noctua's low profile options and they should have something that works for you there, something like the NH-L12S. An AIO might be a good solution for you because the cooler part itself is low profile. So you can often fit it in there in low profile cooling situations where a tower style cooler wouldn't fit. But if you've narrowly avoided disaster with an AIO, and if like me, you've ever had issues with an AIO, then you might be concerned about potential points of failure like the pump failing or leaks, which I haven't experienced very much. Not all AIOs have a great track record. And if you've been burned by one once, even though you will typically get a little bit better performance out of a Ryzen CPU, with an AIO because the lower temperature will often be made up for a little bit by the CPU running at slightly higher clock speeds. Having that potential point of failure in your system isn't always worth it for everyone. So for you, I would say you're probably just fine with that stock prism cooler and then maybe consider something else if you do a CPU upgrade sometime, sometime down the line. Or if it's really making too much noise or bugging you otherwise, uh, I, I'd go with something low profile from Noctua. Next question from Sparkplug Barons, which sounds like a WoW reference, but hey Paul, this is a great format, thank you. Oh good, I'm glad you like it. Can we expect new PCIe 4.0 Riser cables, cables for the new graphics cards? Are they necessary? Now I was using PCIe Riser cables and, and 3.0 ones especially. This is just a box for some of the Thermaltake ones I've been using, but uh, the new cards, the RTX 3080 and 3090 are actually PCI Express 4.0 compatible, but it's hopefully become evident that uh, most of the world records or the high scores right now are being done with like Intel 
Intel 10 900Ks, which are still PCI Express 3.0, and with a two-way SLI configuration, it actually splits those PCIe 3.0 lanes into by eight and by eight. So it's not even a full by 16 connection. We've also been using the riser cables because Nvidia has only been shipping out four slot spaced uh, NVLink SLI bridges so far. And there's really not a whole lot of motherboards that have that spacing because a lot of them went with three slot spacing because that was more popular for graphics cards. And honestly, two way setups have become less and less popular over the past few years. So to answer your question, are they necessary? Uh, no, they're absolutely not necessary right now. And even these newest uh, 30 series cards from Nvidia are not taking advantage of the full bandwidth, even with PCI Express 3.0. Will they exist at some point? I would say probably yes, but if you look at like the Intel side right now and some of the Z490 motherboards, some of them are saying like, yes, we're ready to go with PCIe 4.0 once the CPUs support it. Some of them aren't so sure. So there is a question when it comes to the trace layouts and signaling and latency and maintaining compatibility with the PCIe 4.0 standard. And I'm relying on a lot of speculation here, so I apologize for that, but I would say yes, they probably will come at some point. My question would be how long will they be able to be uh, and still maintain compatibility with PCIe 4.0? We'll find out. Just a couple more questions. This one's a follow-up from the last probing Paul, because I've been talking about using the shift key, uh, shift and restart or shift and shut down with Windows 10. Uh, one more trick from XL, keep it pressed during boot and all the auto run programs will not run. Who knew the shift key was so powerful? I looked this up a little bit more and it seems like auto run and auto play are both disabled if you hold shift while you start up, which also takes place if you log off and then hold shift while you log back on. Auto play is something that functions with like uh, optical drives and like you pop in a CD and then it automatically runs something, so disabling that might give a situational advantage. And apparently this functionality has been around since Windows 7, at least, um, but uh, that's all I have to say on that. I just thought it was a, an interesting little additional thing that you can do with the shift key. Final question here from TJMCC. Paul, inquiring minds and wives want to know, how is Hero doing? Thank you very much for asking about Hero. He is our rescue pup. He's a pit bull mastiff mix and he's about a hundred pounds of big lovable puppy and he's doing great fortunately. There's me petting him in the uh, SLI overclocking video. He's actually right down here napping and, and breathing kind of heavily as I've done this video. So I don't know if you've picked up on that noise at all, but that is usually, if, if you hear breathing in the background while I'm doing a video, it's because Hero's there. He has had some health issues recently, some more health issues I should say. He is, a, he is an old pup, especially for a dog his size and uh, he was having some issues with a paw. He had an abscess on one of his paws that uh, we had to deal with for some time, but fortunately that uh, has gone away and he's doing much better there. We have him on some light pain medication that's also supposed to help him with anxiety because he's he's getting really creaky when he gets up and down and everything like that. But he is doing great and we love him very much and he always loves to come over and, and cuddle up to me wherever I happen to be, which I always enjoy. So that's the status with Hero and that is gonna wrap it up for this video, you guys. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, thank you for all of the questions you submitted, whether they're down in the comment section or the replies I've gotten over on Twitter. I'm not going to watch an AMD thing, which I'm kind of interested in, and I can't tell you very much more about at this point. But uh, if you enjoyed this video, hit the thumbs up button, of course, on your way out. And maybe check the link in the description for my store at paulshardware.net, where you can buy shirts, mugs, pint glasses, and all sorts of other high quality merchandise. Thank you guys so much once again for watching. I'll be back soon with another Probing Paul and other videos too. We'll see you guys in the next one. Mm -hmm.